So, very excited to be here, see all these familiar faces, friends. Uh, I've been multiple times on your side, and I'm very excited to tell the story of how actually uh, we progressed from a Dishpande grant to a company with uh, exciting technology. So, we are in the middle of this revolution, immunotherapy revolution, and to anyone who missed that, it was actually declared as the breakthrough of the year of 2013. What does it mean in immunotherapy? We try to recruit our immune cells to fight cancer. So instead of using uh, chemotherapy or radiation, we want to teach our immune system to actually recognize cancer and kill it. And in the, so at the end of 2013, we had a first approval of a drug uh, by BMS, and then in 2014, we had two additional drugs. So it's a huge, uh, and it's spun, you know, a lot of uh, more innovation around it. So why do we need to do this? The problem is that our immune system is actually trained to recognize pathogens. So if you have a bacterial infection, viral infection, your immune system can recognize that. And we actually have mechanisms that prevent our immune system from recognizing normal cells. You don't want your immune system to fight your own normal cells. And the problem is that cancer is not that different from normal cells. So our immune system really does not recognize cancer. What these uh, therapies were able to do was actually to release one of those breaks from this, in this mechanism that prevents the recognition of cancer. So now in patients where you have a pre-existing immune response to cancer that does not really do anything because you have these breaks that prevent them from acting, now you really see responses, and the responses have been amazing. So you can see, for example, in metastatic uh, melanoma, cures. Like, who heard of a cure in melanoma? These immunotherapies can do that. They cannot do it in every person. They cannot do it in colon cancer. But th when they work, it really is great. So the, the market is huge predicted to be, uh, you know, like 35 billion in 10 years, but there's a lot of work that many companies, including ourselves, um, that are trying to uh, look for other ways to make this work in more patients and in, in more types of cancer. So a short tutorial on the immune system so we can really understand what's going on. The, so it, actually I should have not uh, progress that. So our immune system is actually composed of what we call, so there are two parts to it. There's the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. The innate immune system is what we have from day one after we're born. We have cells that can fight infections. What the adaptive immune system is what comes later with exposure. So when you fight flu or bacterial infections, you get immune cells that recognize these specific pathogens, and what's important is that you have an immune memory. So this, the cells that you generate here are there in your body for the rest of your life, and if you are encountering a, these infections again, they are there, and in a very short time, you can get a response. So if you get a flu shot, what you get is flu. You start preparing, so it takes seven, 10 days to prepare those memory cells, but they will be there when you get the flu, and then it will take you maybe a day or two to respond rather than seven or 10 days. So this is in the context of infectious disease. What I'll show you today is that actually we, sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'll go back. So the current therapies that we, uh, that I described in the previous slide concentrate on those T cells. So these are the cells that have the breaks, and the therapies that were approved release the breaks from those T cells. What I'll show you today, what we do, we actually start with neutrophils. These are the majority of the white blood cells that all of us have that fight infection. And what I'll show you is that actually those neutrophils are very short-lived. They kill, they fight off infection. Now they actually respond to cancer. And then they activate, activate a bunch of other immune cells, including T cells. So you get a really a natural response of the adaptive immune cells of T cells, these holy grail cells that everyone is concentrating on, but in a very natural way. 
So how did it all start? Uh, we approached the Spande Center with a, the, the following observation. I was a postdoc at the Whitehead, uh, just down the street from here, and I was studying the interaction of, of fungal pathogens with neutrophils. And I, was, I discovered a specific sugar that is on the fungal cell wall that those neutrophils recognize. So what we showed uh, the Despander Center, and let's see if I can do that. All right, so we showed them this. These are two uh, time-lapse microscopy slide, uh, movies. These are plastic beads that are coated with a specific sugar called beta-1,6 glucan. And that's a very, that's a control one. It's just a, it's very similar but different sugar. And you can see the neutrophils just engulf on those, all those beads, and here they hardly do anything. So we found a way. We take plastic beads that those neutrophils don't do anything with them. You coat them with another sugar, they still don't do anything. You took this sugar and now they recognize it. They say, ha, I know this, this is a fungus, I need to kill it. So we came to the Despanda and said, we found a way to bring neutrophils and let's see together what, what, when do we need neutrophils, what indication. So they, what we ended up doing was to direct those neutrophils to cancer. We saw in the literature that many people before us thought that neutrophils would be a great cell to direct to cancer because they are very aggressive killers. But how do you do that? So the idea was to take antibodies that many companies have already developed. Uh, decades ago, people have this, and what are antibodies? So many decades ago, people thought that the same way our body makes these structures called antibodies to various infections, maybe we can make antibodies to cancer. So there are already antibodies approved, many of them go out of patent very soon, uh, like Herceptin for breast cancer, cell, uh, for breast cancer uh, Erbitox for colon cancer and others. And these antibodies, what they do, they are like targeted missiles. They can float the body and find the tumor. So what we said, those antibodies will bind, but we attach the sugar. So what did we think will happen? What we said, now we have a tumor, those antibodies will find it, we have this little sugar, now the neutrophils will come and they'll kill the tumor. So the question is, does it work? What, you know, ah, okay. So we showed under the Despande grant that actually it works, and we did that with Herceptin, or in the generic name, Trastuzumab. So you see on the left, these are breast cancer cells, neutrophils here running around in the background. On the right, we call it a Mabexide Trastuzumab. It's the, tr the same Trastuzumab with the sugar. And you see these small cells, these are the neutrophils. So unlike these beads, they cannot engulf them, but they bind them very specifically. They are very active. And what they can do, neutrophils are known to be able to kill also externally. They don't have to engulf them to kill. They actually release all the content, on, content of those cells on the breast cancer cell. So since those days, we've done a lot of work. We actually worked to convert the proof of concept to a drug. So we worked a lot on the sugar itself. We synthesized it. So we started with a biological source. Now we have a synthetic one. We had to come up with a way to decide which size of sugar we want, how many we need to uh, put on every antibody, which chemistry is the best uh, way to do it. And we've done a lot of that, so that's behind us. What I'm showing you here is in a similar way to what I've shown you in the previous movies, this is actually in mice. So this is live imaging of neutrophils. And every time you see these colorful dots, these are activated neutrophils that we can see in live mice. And, and they surround the tumor. And you can see that this is actually with a second antibody we worked on called cetuximab or Erbitox. And you can see that when we have this Mabexide cetuximab, you have a lot of those neutrophils uh, that are uh, surrounding the tumor and very, you know, much less with cetuximab itself or the vehicle control. So the mechanism that worked with Herceptin, now with Erbitox, worked in vitro. This is in vivo. So in efficacy studies, um, 
we have a lot beyond the, the scope of this uh, talk, but I'll show you just a, you know, one, one line of uh, results. So this was done with the Erbitox antibody in a, muta in a cell line that has a Keras mutation, and that's very important because these patients that have these, this mutation actually are not even eligible to Erbitox treatment because they are not responding. They have 0% response. So seeing any effect in this is very uh, important. So you can see that on average, you get a, a slower growth of these tumors as compared to the original antibody. And then, this is a complicated slide, so I'll take you slowly through that and ask me if you have any question. Um, I'm just showing here individual mice because you, with immunotherapies, there's really a range of responses. It's not a cytotoxic that you give and the next day everything goes down. You see a range of responses. So I'll start actually with the controls. Uh, the cetoximab alone, most of the mice look like this. Before day 40, they, they reach the maximum of 2,000, and you have to utilize them, and that's that. We have one mouse that grew slower. We had many control mice that are represented here by this, is in which also it's just a slower growth. With our Mabex cetoximab, we see a range of responses from a slower growth to stasis, to regression. And we've had before, even under the Deshpanda grant, we had a initial indication that, that when you see a good response, you generate memory. So we actually, in this experiment, tested that again. So, they, so what we do is we take these mice and we re-challenge them with the same cancer. So you see here a representative of that. This, even this, so this is the cetuximab one. Uh, even that that primary tumor was slower to grow, you re-challenge with it with the cancer, and it grows readily. So there's no technical issue with the cells or the mice or anything else. Many many control mice. Again, secondary tumor grows just fine. We see that with our treatment, at, at least when you see stasis or regression. You see this secondary grows a little bit and then goes back, and here it doesn't grow at all. So we've seen it now in three different anti uh, two different antibodies, three different cell lines, that when you have either this slower, slow, slow growth or regression, that a memory is generated. And it's, it's, it's like the, the memory that we generate to flu. Now we generated it to cancer. Uh, because we suspected, so what cell is going to mediate memory? We suspected T cells, and uh, what we've done in this experiment was actually to take, this is a tumor that was very slow to grow. You see at day 110, it's at 300. You remember the control was at uh, day below, before day 40, it was already at 2,000. So it's a huge effect. You deplete T cells, and the secondary tumor did not grow. You deplete T cells, and now it takes off exponentially, suggesting that really what kept it in check was the T cells. So what I've shown you here, and, is, and we've shown uh, you know, with other results, is that we see efficacy with two different antibodies, Herceptin and Erbitox, two validated antibodies that everyone knows to, what to expect. We see it in cell lines that are resistant to the naked antibodies. In the case of Erbitox, we see it when you have the Keras mutation, like I showed you here, and also BRAF, which is the same thing. These patients are not even eligible to EGFR therapies. Uh, we've shown it with breast cancer. Uh, we showed this immune memory across these uh, three cancer cell lines and the uh, two antibodies, and we demonstrated the involvement of T cells. We showed it by depletion, like I showed you here, and there's also studies that actually were presenting in two weeks in the American Association of Cancer Research uh, in collaboration with Johns Hopkins. We have a study in a syngenetic model where we show that it's specifically CD8 T cells that those neutrophils are a, are recruiting. So for the people who knows what it means, so, uh, CD8 T cells are cytotoxic C cells. That's really the holy grail. And we found a way for those neutrophils in a natural way to generate those T cells. So to, to summarize, we have the Mabic site is a defined synthetic sugar that we link to antibodies in a precise manner. We, uh, we show that we recruit neutrophils. We show that the neutrophils, in a natural way, 
uh, lead to recruitment of cytotoxic T cells, and we show signs of immune memory. We think that um, it's, it's going to be very synergistic with uh, the current immune oncology programs, like the ones that were approved, because if you have cancers in which you did not have a pre-existing response, now you can generate that and then release the break. So potentially, in addition to a melanoma, lung, renal cancer, where these agents work, maybe you can make it work in other cancer indications and in the, indi in the indications that I mentioned in more patients than it works now. So where are we? We are pursuing a, a candidate toward the clinic. We're planning to get into the clinic in 2016, and we're very actively collaborating with pharma, and I'm saying always that I'm, every time I, I'm just impressed by how many different creative ideas we, I, I can hear from, and every company is different. They have their own ideas how our comp, a platform can actually affect their molecules. So we're attaching our sugar to various antibodies and non-antibodies of partners. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you, Ifat. Um, any, any questions for Ifat? Wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, leukemia, we have not even started. We thought that based, uh, we have not tried it. Uh, we, we thought, so you could do lymphoma with CD20 rituxan, for example. Uh, so you're limited by the antibodies. We did not want initially to make antibodies. We just wanted to improve existing antibodies. So start with validated antibodies so we don't add. You have an unproven technology. We thought that it would we could benefit from just taking an approved antibody. Everyone knows what to expect in terms of efficacy and toxicity and add the sugar on top of that. So we could have done lymphoma rather than maybe not leukemia so much. Uh, there I thought there was a lot going on and we could really, based on the mechanism with the neutrophils infiltration, we could really make a difference in solid tumor. That was the thought. Jeff? For the animal <laughs> Monoclonal for that's a good thought. I, it doesn't, yeah, did not, did have not done that. That's a good idea. But it would be. But I think the beauty of this is that so when you have T cells, they can. So in one person's tumor, there would be you know different mutations that would be different in another one. And when you take an approach like this, you leave it up to the immune system to actually generate the response to whatever that person has. And you don't, I think we, we spent a lot of time on targeted therapies and we're using them here, but we're using them for the first step. So we're using them to find the cancer initially. And then the T cells that come, we have a mechanism to get rid of whatever is, is non-cancer specific. There's tolerance mechanism. So whatever T cells are made are cancer specific and it would be different between people. And I think that's the beauty of it, that you don't have to know, you know, it would be, you know, for every person, there will be a different uh, tailor-made response with an injection of one, one therapy. So I'm not, I'm not letting you have a follow-on, Jeff, because I'm going to keep it on schedule. One more question, that'll be Jason, and then we'll move on. Yeah, it hasn't been easy. So we chose a, a route of the angel investors and non-dilutive funding. So we have very nice group of very committed uh, angel investors, some of them very deep-pocketed, and that was very, very important. Um, so that's part of it. We got a million from the Massachusetts Life Science Center. That was a big validation. We got grants from the National Cancer Institute. And even just being at the Whitehead, we got a Dishpande, DOD. So my advice is actually to, to, do it, to stay in academia as long as you feel that you really 
can, you know, to spin out something that is as mature as possible. Because out there you have deadlines and you have, you know, it's getting much, much harder. Although at a certain point you really need more people. Like I'm here with my name, but there are 10 people behind me that work on this. There are three chemists that do it, you know. That's what they do. There are two biochemists, two pharmacologists. So it's a lot of people working on this. And at a certain stage you need that. So, um, so that's, that's the road we chose. But we are now also, you know, with pitching it to VCs because there's a certain point. Now we feel that we develop the technology to a point that it really can break out, and we have all these collaborations, and we have the internal program, and there's so much to do that we really need uh, more money, and that's that's where we are. But you know, I think it's a natural progression. Well, Nistat, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Great.